You're listening to the Talking Headways Podcast Network. This is Talking Headways, a weekly podcast about sustainable transportation and urban design. I'm Jeff Wood. This week, we're joined by Carl Martins, Associate Professor of Architecture and Town Planning at Technion, Israel Institute of Technology. Carl talks with us about the philosophy underpinning the idea of sufficient accessibility and transport justice. Stay with us. Hey, everybody. We're taking a couple of much-needed weeks off, but in the meantime, I wanted to send you back to episode 325, where we talked with Carl Martins about his book, Transport Justice. I kept coming back to this episode in my mind all year, so I wanted to share it again with folks to listen to and absorb a bit more. Hope everyone has a wonderful holiday and enjoys this flashback replay. Today's podcast is brought to you by our super generous Patreon supporters. Thanks so much for supporting the show. We really appreciate it. To join this merry band of infrastructure nerds and zoning wizards, go to patreon.com slash the overhead wire. $2 a month gets you stickers and a handwritten note. $10 a month gets you one of our bus-only scarves. The fall is almost here, so get one to warm your transit-loving heart today. Go to patreon.com slash the overhead wire. Today's podcast is also brought to you by the projects of the overhead wire, including our 15-year-old Daily Cities newsletter, read around the world. We pull the best news about cities from around the web and share them with readers each morning. It's the best newsletter in the business, so try us out for free by going to theoverheadwire.com. You'll also find links to buy the scarf as well as our audiobook version of Raymond Unwin's 1909 classic Town Planning in Practice. Go to theoverheadwire.com to find out more. Carl Martins, welcome to the Talking Headways podcast. Thank you for hosting me. It's fun to be here. Well, thanks for joining us and thanks for sending the book along. It was a really fascinating read. I'm wondering, before we get started, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, so I'm Dutch by origin, uh, based in Israel now, for the last 20 years, going back and forth. I'm an urban planner by training. Holland is um, one of the Valhallas of uh, urban planning, at least perceived to be. I wouldn't say they were successful in all domains, but, but I'm not, certainly not doing bad. So that's where I got my training. And I slowly rolled into transport through my PhD. And then when I came to Israel, although I felt very much linked to urban planning and the discourse about democratization of government, I actually, they, they defined me as a transport expert. And so I followed the flow. And that's how I uh, became actually a transport planner. And that's what I call myself today. So when did you get interested in cities and planning? Was it when you were a kid or was it when you're older? I knew when I was 16 that I wanted to be an urban planner, study urban planning. Nobody around me knew what the Dutch word for urban planning meant. I don't know how I figured out what it was. I remember when I became a PhD student, there was a little department magazine and they interviewed all new PhD students. And I remember telling the story that I remember in kindergarten, they would build things with wooden cubes and I remember or a reconstructed memory but that I would build in my perspective very sophisticated cities and I would look at my fellow kids in kindergarten and say why don't you build anything decent uh, so there was something apparently in me of building cities uh, although I don't think that the work of an urban planner nowadays building and designing cities is really a process it's really a policy science more than a design science but I guess there was always something in me that liked cities and creating cities well, you took that policy science to your book, definitely. I imagine that's where that came from, in part, for the book, Transport Justice. Yeah, I think in, in my PhD time, I really came to realize that urban planning is, first and foremost, a policy science. And so it's about what is the role of government in shaping our cities. And I took that perspective also to transport, to more fundamentally reflect on what is the role of government in shaping our transport systems? And are we really thinking about this very carefully? And I think we don't. What was the impetus for starting the book and for getting it going? I rolled into the domain of justice kind of by luck in a way. I was working in an environmental simulation laboratory where people worked with models and simulation experiments. And I had no experience at all in modeling, urban planning being a social science. And in order to do something with modeling anyway, in transport modeling, and to contribute to the field, I had to invest, invent something new. And I came up with the idea, let's, let's think about how transport benefits some people and not others, which then later on I figured out there was quite some literature about it, but not that much and certainly not in modeling or very few. So I kind of rolled into justice and transport because of the challenge to do something new in modeling. And then when I started diving into this field, I felt that transport is very much an empirical field, analyzing transport flows, trying to understand behavior, but very rarely reflecting on what is 
the duty of government for the entire population? To what extent should we provide transport to everybody or don't we have to do so? And then I felt that this is really, really a topic that, that I could further develop. And I felt like this will be my, what I call a niche, but I don't think it's a niche what I'm doing. But, you know, the one is field in which you want to excel and make your name. So in a way, it was luck. But if I look back at when I was a PhD student, I wrote quite a lot of opinion pieces, op-ed pieces for the Dutch newspapers. And there's already one piece where it's just, okay, that's what it says exactly what is in the book, but, you know, in very accessible language criticizing a government policy for for basically ignoring a large majority of the population when they shape transport systems. And that's interesting because it seems like we, you know, a society generally focus on those empirical data-driven analysis to be the quote-unquote right answer, whereas in your book you kind of go through and discuss an approach to thinking about justice through these theories, right? So thinking about almost as a philosopher and kind of weeding pieces of philosophy out to get to a discussion about transport versus weeding data out to get to an answer that you think is correct. Well, I think data can never give the answer because the question comes from somewhere else. It doesn't come from the data. And so only if you know how to frame the question right, you can use the data efficiently and effectively. So I think that's a step that lots of transport research tend to ignore and jump into the data. What can the data tell us? Well, the data can tell you a lot about behavior, about choice, about different trends, but it cannot tell you what you should do, what we ought to do. And transport is fundamentally a policy science, as I already said. And it's not only a policy science in an abstract term. It's basically the field of government where billions are spent, public money, every year in every country. And where without the government, nobody can move. So more than any other field, except maybe for defense, it is very much a domain in which the government has to decide what to do. And to decide what to do is a question about what you ought to do. It's not about figuring out from the data what's happening in the world. I mean, we can, of course, describe what's happening in the world, but I won't tell you what you have to do tomorrow. That is a question about will and a desirable future. And that is ultimately, of course, on one hand, a democratic question. What kind of society do we as citizens want? But it's also a philosophical question, a question about right and wrong. And that's how I rolled into philosophy. And if I look back at my studies, I was always interested and attracted by philosophy. So I was happy that finally I could make some practical use of it. So, you know, you come up with an idea that I think we're talking about more in the United States, which is the idea of accessibility to think about connecting people with places rather than just things like level of service or other kind of more data-driven slash engineering focused measures. So where did your thoughts, you know, about accessibility come from and what is accessibility? Where did accessibility as your kind of main focus come from? Well, accessibility has been a term that's been around for very long, of course, in, in geography, urban planning. The mobility focus in transport has been criticized for at least 40 years, I would say. So focusing on accessibility as the set of opportunities people can reach is in a way nothing new. What maybe I try to develop more is thinking about, okay, if accessibility is so important, what level of accessibility do people deserve? And accessibility is in research typically seen as a very technical measure, but in a way it's a measure of freedom. Fundamentally saying, you know, how free am I to do what I want to do tomorrow? So today I have this job, but maybe tomorrow I want to have another job. Now only if I have a rich set of jobs available, I can at all consider to try to apply for another job. Today I'm playing football. Tomorrow, I maybe want to play tennis. Now, I can only make this choice if I have this opportunities available. Today, I'm meeting my neighbor, but I would like to meet much more people. Well, only if I have access to them, I can meet them. So accessibility is fundamentally a measure of freedom, freedom to give direction to your own life. And so in this sense, it's very much linked to philosophy, because philosophy is very much about autonomy and freedom and thinking about providing every person with the opportunity to flourish. And for flourish, we need opportunity. So in this sense, accessibility is much more than this technical term in which it many cases used in transport research and also in more and more in practice. And this is a good thing. I mean, it's not a, it's a good measure for transport planning, a measure that comes closest to the idea of freedom, much more than the freedom of the road, which of course engineers like to see as also an essential freedom. And, and it is in a way freedom to be able to move, but if you can't get to any places, although you can freely move, it doesn't give you too much. 
And that's why inevitably, if you think about it deeper, you have to measure accessibility and not how easy can I move around. And that's why accessibility is a key concept that should enter transport planning. And it's more and more entering transport planning where it often still lacks is thinking not about, okay, let's increase average accessibility. Let's improve it. Let's go to this growth curve. But thinking about who has it and who doesn't have it. And fundamentally, the distributive question. And then it becomes very difficult because then you have to ask, okay, what does everybody deserve? And then it becomes really philosophical. Well, that's interesting. And so in the book, you go through to find out what, quote unquote, sufficient accessibility is or the general idea of finding that out. You go through three theories of justice and that kind of frames your overall approach in the book. Each of these three theories from Rawls and Waltzer and Dworkin paints a picture of your final discussion about what is sufficient accessibility. I want to go back into those three theories and kind of understand what each of them kind of says and what it said to you and why they matter to justice overall. Mm -hmm. So for me, the Michael Waltzer's book, Spheres of Justice, was an eye-opener because when I entered the field of transport and justice, I started reading philosophy because I realized we cannot just measure equity in, in some way we want. So there's, there have been quite some studies in equity and transport, very data-driven, you could say. But for me, it was not enough to map differences between people. It was really about the question, what do we owe to each other? And so I started reading lots of philosophy, and philosophy tends to be very abstract, and talk about the world in very abstract and general terms. So we have people and they have abstract goods that have to be distributed and very sophisticated ideas of what is fairness. And of course, John Rawls's theory is the most well-known one, but that didn't really help me because they, they remain so abstract and in my perspective were not relevant, not applicable to transport. And what Michael Walter did was actually saying, you know, just it is not about this abstract world of the ideal theory. It's really about distributing a variety of goods that we have in society, which we value highly and which we don't think should be left to the market or to random will who gets them and who doesn't get them. And he then describes various fields of government where broad agreement has emerged about how goods should be distributed. And he talks about welfare and housing, hard work, talks about political power and so forth. He didn't talk about transport. But for me, this was like an eye opener. I said, okay, justice is not really this only this abstract theory. The abstract theories are still very useful, but it's very much about thinking that there are various goods that people really care about and thinking how we should distribute these. Yeah. And, and to me, when I was reading what you were writing and thinking about, you know, Waltzard's ideas, the idea that came to me is it kind of helps you discern what is a public utility and what is just the regular market. So you can buy any type of knife you want to be a cooking knife, and it doesn't necessarily matter to other people. It's not a good that you need to share with other people, et cetera. So there's a price for it and there's, a, you know, supply and demand and those types of things. But there's other goods that are public utilities like healthcare and like transport or electricity or even internet. And so this was really interesting to me in that it set those things aside as something important for people that could operate. You had to think about it in a different way. Yeah, his, his Michael Walter's point is not that this, these are given as public utilities, but they emerge. Society itself decides that they are so important that they become public utilities that we decide we cannot leave this to the market. If we leave it to the market, then we create a society which is not the society we want. And that's why healthcare, when we didn't know too much about illnesses and cure, it wasn't really an issue, also didn't have the money. But as soon as modern medicine became really effective, people realized that health is very important. And so also healthcare becomes important. And actually the US is, of course, a notable exception on the general agreement worldwide, I would say, that healthcare should be provided to all. Now, of course, many countries don't have the means to deliver, but they would agree to that principle in the US is the notable exception to my regret. Uh, I want universal health care. <laughs> I'll just say that right now. <laughs> yeah. uh, so in a way, transport, it was always a public utility in a way. Streets were always collective. I mean, from the first development of human history, you know, where people were living in huts or caves, I don't know what, and we jointly created our paths. We just walked on the same path and this was were our roads. And this, of course, evolved. And when we started building cities, Streets were public goods and they were maintained either jointly or everybody had to contribute his own time to maintain uh, roads. 
but there was no issue of distribution because basically everybody walked. There were very few people with horses and carriages. And so there was no issue of some people having superb accessibility and others virtually none. Those people on the horses didn't shape city size or city structure. It were the people walking because they were the vast majority, 90% or more. And so since everybody could walk, or mostly walk, it didn't emerge as an issue. Transport was there, accessibility was given for most people. And only when actually we started introducing more motorized means of transport, differences between population groups started to emerge. And this happened actually quite late. I mean, in the beginning, it was mass transport. It was a trolley, a bus, a horse pulled trams, uh, trains, very cheap, very accessible, often also offered as a, as a subsidy, by the way, even in the early days, because developers wanted to uh, attract development to, to new plots of land. And when the welfare state evolved, it was still no issue. Certainly in the Europe, car ownership was low. People could reach by walking public transport or, or cycling at their destinations. And so in my perspective, transport missed the boat of the welfare state. It was never perceived as a welfare state element because there was no issue. Where well, there was an issue in education, not everybody got a good education, only the elite. Healthcare, if we didn't insure everybody, even the elite would have difficulty to get this expensive operation. So it was clear that you had to do something. But transport was not an issue when the welfare state was built. And it's for me, one of the explanations why we developed a, a transport governance system that is completely different from the other domains of education, healthcare, housing, which are in many countries and certain European countries uh, built on principles of justice. After Walzer, you get to Rawls and you think about accessibility improvements and how they benefit people overall. And so in here, you wrote, accessibility improvements benefit everyone until the network is built out. However, access improvements that benefit the rich group aren't equitable because over time, land uses adjust in the service of the rich, pushing out the poor from access. So once you built these transport networks, you have basically this kind of bifurcation of the distribution of land as well, because people are buying up land near transport. And I found that very interesting as part of that discussion in the Rawls section of the book. So if you talk about justice, you, you cannot avoid Rawls. It's considered the most important uh, philosopher's justice of the 20th century. And so you have to relate his theory, develop this theory for abstract goods, also a limited set of goods. So he, he does talk a little bit of education, but basically it's about basic uh, rights and freedoms, and it's about income and wealth. These are the most important goods and opportunities to, to, to jobs. And he built up a beautiful uh, framework in which you can actually balance these various goods. Because the challenge, of course, in, in justice is we want all. And if we would be wealthy, we would like to give everybody everything, <laughs> right? But it doesn't work like this because there's scarcity. And justice only emerges because there is scarcity in the first place, because we desire something and we can't have it all. Not every one of us and not everybody can have everything. And so Rawls managed to build up a framework that actually managed to balance uh, freedoms, basic freedoms of speech, of organization, of religion, with restrictions on how income and wealth are distributed. But the moment you start adding a good to, to Rawls theory, it becomes very difficult to say, well, do I want to have an higher income or do I want to improve my accessibility? And that's where the theory didn't help me anymore. I said, okay, yeah, well, you want both, but I don't know whether I can tax the rich more to give the poor more accessibility or actually more income. It becomes very unclear and so it becomes only a political decision. And so it didn't give me this that direction towards the principle of justice for transport. And that's where, I mean, the, the dynamic you describe about slowly bifurcation happening and the wealthy getting more and more ac accessibility and the poor less because land use start organizing around the dominant means of transport. That happens, but the question is whether that's a problem and, and Rawls theory couldn't give me an answer after a certain point. Up to a certain point, okay, yes, it still makes sense to make this trade-off and then after a certain point, not anymore. And so... In a way, I was left empty-handed to analyzing Rawls' theory and trying to apply it. On the other hand, Rawls' theory offers so much that it gives you all kind of building blocks about thinking about justice, about reasoning about justice, about a fundamental idea, which I found very enriching, is that justice is something we all feel very strongly about. And 
the classical story about the little kids going to kindergarten and telling, this is mine. I brought it from home. Uh, or you get a bigger piece of the cake. Or you got two candy eyes, only one. We feel very deeply about fairness and, and the default is equality. And so what Rawls says, we have this intuitions about justice and they're more sophisticated than what a child in kindergarten has. And this enables us actually to figure out what are reasonable principles of justice. So we can, on the one hand, develop philosophy, and then we can share this with people who didn't go for this argument and see whether it makes sense to them. And if it doesn't make sense, then we can educate the people to some extent and challenge them to reconsider their intuitions. That might lead to change. But we should also go back to our theory and reconsider the theory and see if we can come up with a proposal that is more in line with the intuitions. And so that idea of coming to a reflective equilibrium, as called in Rawls' perspective, is very useful, I think. So you, you never think about principles of justice in vacuum. It's really figuring out what you can justify and then checking whether it fits to the intuitions of people. And I think in, in the end, the sufficiency principle I come up with is so intuitive that you can say, what did this guy spend his 10 years working on his book for? <laughs> it's obvious. <laughs> yeah. It is if you think about it, but at the same time, I do appreciate that you went through the steps of figuring out what would work and what might not work. I mean, the discussion of Rawls is frustrating just because you do see these things that you think should apply to transport. But in the end, like you say, it doesn't quite fit into an overall kind of transportation planning function, right? It works as an equity discussion, as a justice discussion. But, and at the end, I was actually frustrated reading the book. You're like, well, it doesn't quite work out. And I was like, well, then why did I read that last chapter for? <laughs> <laughs> I never thought about that. I, I know that I have to write a book that's more accessible and it doesn't make such a long philosophical story about nothing. I, pre I appreciate it though. I mean, like, I, you know, okay. just reading, I was like, what, well, what the hell, man? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, reading Walter and then thinking more systematically about Rawls made me realize that Rawls' theory is not a universal theory of, of justice. It basically develops a very, very powerful argument for only three domains or three spheres, and Michael Walsh would say, the spheres of basic rights and freedoms, the sphere of opportunity, of jobs, and the third sphere is that of income and wealth. And Rawls' theory, although it's very, very broad and very, very powerful, I think, doesn't go further than that. It doesn't tell us really what we owe to each other in healthcare and education, and certainly not in transport, which doesn't make his contribution to philosophy uh, less impressive. Yeah. Well, then we get to the desert island. Yes. <laughs> which I was, I was interested in that too. I keep thinking about, you know, desert island top fives or, you know, music you'd listen to, but actually it's the distribution of goods if you get to it. And all these folks have interesting catchphrases, as it were. You have the, the veil of ignorance, you have the desert island, mm -hmm. you have all these things. Yeah. But Dworkin has the desert island auction. Can you explain that a little yeah. bit more? So uh, Dworkin wants to think about what would be a fair distribution of goods, and he, he feels that preferences should play a stronger role in that. He feels that, that preference has been underplayed in way in, in thinking about justice and, and mostly also about in Rawls' perspective. And so he creates a thought experiment in which people worship on an uninhabited island, and rather than hitting each other on the head, which most uh, people would likely start doing, or some percentage, and trying to grab as much of the island as possible, he assumes that his shipwreck survivors are actually reasonable people and sit down and think about how they will share the goods they find on the island, which belong to nobody. And it's really an inhabited island. And so they sit down and they say, OK, let's do the default and let's give everybody the same amount of candies or in his example, coconuts and pineapples. Let's say every day there's enough for five coconuts and five pineapples for everybody. But once it's being distributed the first day or the second day, some person steps up and says, I know I get five of these and five of those like you do, but I don't like pineapples. I never like pineapples. And so I really don't have the same as you have. Although we have the same number, my preferences are not served as well as your preferences. And so I think this is very unfair. And we should think about a different system of distributing the coconuts and pineapples, which we have on the island. And people sit down again, I think very carefully, and they come up then with the auction ID, which basically says, okay, we give everybody shells, which you find on the beach, and these are worthless. Nobody wants the shells. You can't eat them. You can't build a house from them. You can't wear them. 
we give everybody the same, which is kind of their resources, their basic resources. And so everybody starts out his life on the islands with the same set of resources. And with these resources, they can bid for what is really valuable, the coconuts and the pineapples. And so in this bidding process, people can then offer for what they prefer most. And obviously, if you don't like pineapples, you will offer more for coconuts and vice versa. And depending on how the preferences are distributed in the population on the island, coconuts might be more expensive or pineapples. And so if you have a preference that most people share, you will have less goods. But so let's say coconuts are more expensive and you like coconuts. So instead of having 10 fruits, you will only have eight. And the one who likes pineapple will have 12 pineapples. And Dworkin says this is fair because, first of all, everybody started out with the same set of resources. So, you know, we started equally and you freely entered into this bargain. And this is what you came out with. And second, if you look at your neighbor, do you really want 12 pineapples? You didn't like pineapples, right? No, you wouldn't. So you have no real reason to envy your neighbor and no reason to bid for that. And if you really wanted that, you could bid for that. So we can do it all over again. Now let's see if you do it again. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> and so he says this, it's envy free. And so it's a fair distribution. And so inequality can be fair as long as it serves different preferences and starts from a situation of equality, equality of resources. Now, the whole island story is a little bit a gimmick, I would say, for more fundamental idea of ensuring yourself against all kinds of forms of bad luck. So now what if I'm more hungry than you are and I actually need 15 fruits and you can survive on five? If I start with the same set of resources, you are better off than me because I have to purchase 15 and you only five. We can then think about all kinds of insurance schemes to protect ourselves against this risk of being a very hungry person or being disabled, being more, less productive, and it develops all kinds of insurance schemes. And those insurance schemes kind of help me to construct my scenarios for trends. Sport. In a way, I think it was very useful for me. I think it's very boring to talk about it, although I tend to do it in my courses. <laughs> to explain, you know, okay, now let's imagine that people wash up on the island and it's not this idyllic island of only palm trees. No, it's Hong Kong Island. I always show a picture of Hong Kong Island, except Hong Kong Island without any people. So we know where the destinations are. So we know where we want to be because we want to know where we want to be, where the destinations are, employment, fun. And now you have to choose where to live. So a location to purchase, a house to purchase, save money for trips and so forth. And then I, I start the whole auction scheme to develop what is a fair metropolitan system you could say for transport. Yeah. So you pulled all the three together and there were some that work, some that don't. And you took the auction slash insurance scheme idea and kind of move that forward using some of the principles of the other ones as well. I mean, general justice principles. Especially the veil of ignorance of John Rawls, of course. So the idea is that the people washing up on Hong Kong Island and having to think about, you know, who can live where and what kind of transport system to create on that island, and they are sitting behind a veil of ignorance. That means they have to agree on how the world will look like without knowing who they will be in the real world. So when the veil of ignorance is lifted, people have to start living in the world they created based on the rules they decided upon behind the veil of ignorance. They sit behind the curtain, they discuss what the world should look like, they agree, the veil is lifted, and then they have to live according to those rules and they cannot be changed. And so this means, you know, you have to be very, very careful. And so Rawls' theory is not about risk avoidance. It's really about fundamentally shaping a world in which you can agree to live no matter who you will be. That basic notion is also then translated in my book to transport. So you have to design the transport system and you have to agree to live with it, knowing that you might be the one who doesn't own a car, who's disabled, who has a low income. But you know you want to visit your grandmother and your children and want to have a job and go to the supermarket and visit church maybe, go to the beach every now and then. What system would you create? Well, not the system we have nowadays. Clearly not. It would be a very different system. And so that getting to all those places circles around back again to our questions about accessibility, sufficient accessibility, yeah. and what that actually is. You know, I'm curious, you talk about also person accessibility versus place accessibility. What is the importance of the agency of a person versus a place? A person being able to access things instead of just a place being able to access a place. Well, from a perspective of justice, it's, it's fundamentally about people. So places don't have rights. We don't give them a right to vote. We don't give them a right to be serviced in a certain way. We give people rights. And so thinking about accessibility from a justice perspective is fundamentally about thinking from the person. How easy can a person get to a range of places? 
that is the first and most important standard of justice. Now, it becomes more complex when you start planning a real world context, because if you want to think about where I'm going to put my hospital, I have to make a decision about a place and not about people. It's implicitly and indirectly I decide who can reach that hospital and who cannot. And so translating the sufficient accessibility principle, which applies to all the persons living in a region, has then to be translated into how I make my hospital accessible for different people by different means of transport. It probably also affects the location. It becomes a, technically a difficult issue, I would say, to figure that out, and especially because we don't have a fair system. So it will be difficult to imagine at the current situation, no matter where I put my hospital, I won't find any location that provides everybody with sufficient accessible to this hospital. So it's actually one of the things I didn't solve yet also in my teaching. I always at the end of the lectures, I uh, course, I want to get to that. And it's, it's not finally set, you know, how do you decide about where to locate? What do you demand from an employer, a hospital, a school? And also, you know, in the discussion of the philosophies and when you get to the discussion about designing a transport system, you come up with an idea to draw a chart where you look at accessibility and you find that certain areas where accessibility levels are so low they directly limit the possibility of a person to participate in a broad range of activities becomes an issue. You have a general accessibility and then you have a low level of accessibility, you have your high level of accessibility, but you should be designing the transport system to get the people who don't have as much access more access, whereas the people at the top who have, you know, amazing amounts of access, they don't need a lot of help. Correct. So first of all, let's say that my whole auction scheme comes up with, if, if I'm sitting behind a veil of ignorance and I have to design a transport system and I don't know what I will be, rich or poor, healthy or not, born in a rural town or in a city, highly educated or not, I don't know all these things, I would never accept a transport system that doesn't give me sufficient accessibility. Because if it doesn't give me sufficient, it means it's insufficient. It means insufficient. I cannot get to the places I want to get to. It doesn't give me the freedom to give direction to my life, philosophers would say. So I cannot choose the job I want to have. I might be lucky. I might live in this small town where there's one employer and I might work there. But if he closes down, I'm out of work. So it doesn't give me sufficient accessibility. The certainty that I can actually have a flourishing life over the long time. And so that's basically why Behind the veil of ignorance, we would not agree to anything less than sufficient accessibility. Now, that term sufficient accessibility leaves two terms quite undefined. So one is accessibility, which you can measure in many, many ways. And I don't think there's a perfect way to measure accessibility, except to say you should measure how easy it is to get to places, how affordable it is, and whether it's relatively convenient to get to places and to a range of places. It's not about your current job, your current pub where you like to go to. It's really about a range of places because your life changes all the time. The other term that is vague is sufficient. What is sufficient? Basically, that is in a way a political. It's not merely an empirical term. So we have lots of research, partly in the US, more in the UK, especially about the relationship between accessibility and social exclusion, where we see that people who have very poor access to cars or to high quality public transport systems are excluded from many, many activities. In the US also, there's lots of research showing a connection between low accessibility and low employment, welfare payments, but also social isolation, lower healthcare uptake. In the US, there's literature on food deserts, so you don't get your healthy nutrition. So we, we know there's a connection between accessibility and having a flourishing life, which includes employment, seeing family and friends, being able to buy the food you need, and so forth. But we don't know exactly the empirical connection. There's not been much studies to say, you know, okay, if you have this amount of accessibility, well, then you're really doing fine. But if it drops below a certain level, you're really at, at risk. So we know if you're very low, you're clearly at risk. And if you're, you know, if you have a car and you live somewhere in the city, the core city, you're doing fine if you have sufficient income to run the car. But we don't know where the tipping point is. And I don't think we can ever find a tipping point. It will be a vague scale. At some point, you see more and more people struggling to get to the places they need to get to. So there will never be a perfect point. Now, this is no different from income. In the domain of income, you know, there is a poverty line and we all know the poverty line is defined based on a set of criteria, an assessment of what it costs to buy a certain basket of goods that everybody needs. But in some places they will be more expensive and others will be cheaper. Some 
persons manage to do with very little money and other people need much more. They're more hungry, they need more medicine, whatever. Their family and friends live further away, so they need more gasoline or more bus tickets. So it's a rough indicator. And that ultimately is a political decision. So we have input, we know a little bit about income, we know about cost of living, and based on this we set an income level. We can do exactly the same for transport. It's just a matter of collecting the evidence and then setting up a way to decide about this level in a political way. And clearly, politics may play a role. So certain parties may pull us up and they would like to be generous. And other think we shouldn't be so generous. We can, it can be lower. It's really sufficient if it's at this level. And yes, life is not that great, but it's good enough. And so that is the sufficiency line. Now, the, the fundamental point of the book, I would say, the most fundamental point is that if you agree that this, I think, intuitively appealing principle of sufficient accessibility, so sufficiency as a principle of, of justice for distributing transport services, then the whole world changes. The whole world of transport changes because the moment you say sufficiency is what counts, is what I have to deliver as a government to everybody, it doesn't matter where the line is exactly. You will figure out, no matter how low you put it, that there are millions of people who don't get enough accessibility. And my first and foremost obligation is to give them enough because that's what we owe to each other. That's what we agree upon behind the veil of ignorance. And so the moment you agree the sufficiency principle, you have to change your entire perspective of looking at transport. What What is my duty? Well, my duty is not anymore to the people who are high up on the accessibility ladder. We can take all people in a metropolitan region and we can measure accessibility and it doesn't really matter how we exactly measure it as long as we use the systematic same way for each person and we will clearly see a ranking, right? And so if you live in the middle, in the core city, in the city center and you are wealthy and you have a car and you can afford a parking and you can ride public transport and you can take a taxi anytime you like it, you're on the top, right? And if you live further out and you have a car, you might still be doing well. If you don't have a car, you're really, really bad off. But actually, if you live even in the city or certainly just in the first ring around the core city and you don't have a car, even in European cities, by the way, you are very, very poorly served and you are quickly below the sufficiency line. And so we can rank people and then we say, oh, wow, well, my challenge has changed fundamentally where the discourse in too many cities is either congestion is a problem and we have to address congestion or this i mean we, we're creating terrible climate change and pollution and we have to do something about that the fundamental challenge is now we have people that are not served well are below what we think they deserve and we should improve the situation for them so that's a radically different perspective and it's actually congestion evaporates as a problem in most cases not all cases okay that depends it's an empirical question but most people in congestion are in congestion because it's the fastest way from A to B. They're not in congestion because this is the worst choice they could make. This is the best choice. And this means if this is the best choice, this is made by a person who has a car, who is able to afford that car and run it. Next to that person will live virtually in all neighborhoods, not everywhere in the US if it's strong income segregation, but in most places, somebody who doesn't own a car, he doesn't have that choice. You won't see him on that road. But he's actually the person who is really suffering from insufficient accessibility. It's unlikely it's a person with a car will have that. Now, maybe at the very edge of the metropolitan region, you will find people with a car with insufficient accessibility, and you do find them. But there, it's not caused by a poor transport system. It's because of lack of land uses. That was great because it gets to this point and the point of the book in that radically changing the way that you look at how to solve transportation issues is looking at people and their needs rather than problems to solve, right? So problems like congestion, problems like the environment, you know, thinking about people first is what I got out of reading the book. And it's interesting to think about when you think about environmental problems and you're trying to target them, and we do want to target them because they are important, especially in this mm -hmm. age of climate change. Definitely. But it makes you focus on things that you don't want to focus on. So if you're targeting congestion or you're targeting environmental issues, you're actually talking more about the car than you want to be talking about. And what you need to be talking about, and what, what I learned from the book, is that you need to be talking about population groups, people in certain segments of society that need to have more accessibility rather than targeting the segment of a road that's congested or you know, the need to reduce particulate matter, which I think is important. But by solving the people problem, I think you get to solve all the problems. 
let me take these two problems, tackle them separately. So congestion emerged as the main problem because transport as a field of research and of, of uh, government practice evolved from other engineering disciplines. The other engineering disciplines were basically, in a way, very progressive. So they emerged at the end of the 19th century, uh, water systems, electricity systems, sewerage systems. And the engineers were very, very ambitious and very progressive. The cities were very polluted and they saw in these new technologies the opportunity to make life better. And their idea was just to build systems and connect each and every person to that system. And that's what they did, or that's what we did as a society, at least in most places. And the transport engineers took that same idea. We have this wonderful new technology, it's called the car. We combine it with the other wonderful new concept called the highway, great separated highway. And the only challenge we have is just connecting everybody to this wonderful new road system. And then they can connect to the system just like they can open the water tap and everybody is served. I'm not sure that they entirely believe this, but it's certainly how they designed the system. It's just a matter of rolling out the roads over the entire country. And that's what happened without any consideration for what we do today, which is a cost-benefit analysis. We wouldn't have built many of the highways we built out in faraway places where till today the demand is too low to justify a road according to this cost-benefit principle. But we did it because of the same engineering progressive perspective. This is a new technology and we should connect everybody to it. Now, what works in electricity and water and sewerage doesn't work for transport, right? If you have water in the home, a kid of two years old can open the tap and close the tap uh, with some care. They can also use electricity pretty young. After potty training, the toilet is also available for them. It doesn't work like this in transport. And the road system will never serve everybody. But that thinking of, of having a system that works basically calculating the volumes that my system has to send from A to B, whether it's electricity or water or sewerage, that philosophy is still so ingrained in the transport engineering principle. That's that's how they look at the system and congestion is a failure, like a blackout in electricity is a failure. But that is a wrong measure of failure in the transport system because the system is not important. Having a working system doesn't guarantee that people have accessibility. Even free-flowing traffic doesn't guarantee that everybody has accessibility. Go to very remote places where you always have free-floating traffic and you know the end anywhere. And that's not really what we want to offer people. What transport is all about is getting to destinations. And so that's the congestion part. It's just still stuck in the engineering perspective. Starting from very good intentions of delivering the best possible system to everybody and failing to realize that this system can never serve anybody. And politically, that was also uh, embraced. I don't know in the US, but I know in the Netherlands, I know in Israel, I know in the UK, there was mostly social Democrats politicians saying a car for every family. That was the vision. And if everybody had a car, transfer problems were solved. We just have to build a road system. Uh, the wife didn't count, but the, the car was, of course, for the man going to work. <laughs> Back in the day, yeah. Exactly. And children were invisible, apparently, or were just in a temporary time frame, you know, about to be adults to drive cars. But even adults, even in the US, we didn't get to the level that everybody has cars. They are expensive. They are impairments. Not everybody likes driving. People are scared of driving. In a metropolitan area like Los Angeles, 20% of adults doesn't have access to a car. One in five adults, that's an enormous amount in a wealthy country. We didn't manage to get there. We will never get there. That should be a fundamental starting point. And if you realize that, you should start from people and ask, is everybody served by the transport system? And so congestion might still be a problem. But in many cases, those in congestion are served much better than those who cannot enjoy congestion and do not have access to a car and has to use public transport. Sometimes they can use bicycle and so forth. So that's the congestion part. Congestion might lead to insufficient accessibility, but if it doesn't, okay, it's not a problem. It's annoying. It's unpleasant. I'm also sometimes in congestion. It is very annoying. I like free-flowing traffic myself, <laughs> okay, if I drive. But that something is annoying is not enough reason to pour lots of public money into it. And certainly not if you realize all the damage, of course, that is being done because of increasing road capacity. Now, that's that part of the story. So congestion, we can really park only if it leads to insufficient accessibility. We have to address it. Otherwise, you know, if people want to buy their way out of congestion by financing a separate lane, we might consider 
if it doesn't do too much other damage. Now let's go to the other damage, that's climate. But not only climate, I think just talking about climate is already distancing us educators, people who design the transport system, many people who suffer much more from pollution than maybe directly from climate change, although also disadvantaged population groups are of course more affected by climate change than more advantaged groups because if you're advantaged, you can always find your way out and move to better places. But uh, so environment broadly, not only climate change, local pollution, very important, but it's not a goal of transport. Transport has one goal. It's enabling people to get to destination. So if you focus on environment, you lose sight of that goal. So it's a condition. And for me, the condition should be much tighter. We should say, okay, we really have to deliver within this pollution level, within this climate goal, deliver sufficient accessibility to all. It's a condition, but it's not a goal. But if you define it as a goal, you lose track of actually measuring whether everybody is served. And it's very important to realize, and I think I said it already in the beginning, that nobody, there is no such thing as private transport. So we like to think if we have our own car, and maybe our own bicycle in the Netherlands, that we are the king of the road and that we are independent and that we have our own private transport, but we are all fundamentally dependent on collective investments. There is no such thing as somebody that can actually entirely in private land move from A to B. There's been a very short period in history that roads were built uh, based on, on tolls. All those companies went bankrupt. It didn't work. It was highly problematic. The only way to actually get from A to B is having a collective investment which we usually ask the government to do on behalf of us. And so I mean, we're all dependent on the government. And what the government has been doing is saying, you know, yeah, we're responsible for government, for transport, but actually only for a small group of people. So we don't have this duty for people who don't express demand in a willingness to pay in a value of time. If they cannot express their demand or their desire to get to a place in actual demand, they don't exist. So something that's so fundamentally public, where everybody's dependent on each other, is actually only made available to not a small group of the people. Of course, the vast majority, and that makes it so attractive politically, right? You can ignore the 20, 10% that's not being served, because they're anyway politically not very powerful. But obviously, that's not how good government would work or should work. Right. You talked about cost-benefit analysis a little earlier. You know, one of the things that I found interesting in your discussion as well was the discussion about cost-benefit analysis for, say, a, a transit project. And, you know, when you do that and when you look at the costs and then the benefits, the benefits aren't always, if you aren't looking at it from a people perspective, you get off track because when you're looking at a low-income person's wage and the time saved and you're measuring the time saved for that person, that low wage and the time saved makes it unequal from a high wage earner, you know, thinking about the disconnect between those things. And so it really made me think like, why are we doing these cost benefit analysis when you're actually discounting some of the value of people generally just because of the wages that they make? The use of cost benefit analysis is something very, very surprising in a way you could say, if you, if you really take a step back. Uh, so it's, it's surprising for two reasons. One is because we're talking here about government investments and, and the government steps in when the market doesn't do its job. But what actually the government then does, it uses cost-benefit analysis, which is kind of a proxy for what the market does. A market would provide a good if the costs are lower than what it can earn by it and preferably optimize the profits, right? So basically what the government is doing is exactly the same. So we're a government, uh, we can act differently than the market. We usually act differently like the market because we think the market is not doing a good job in a certain domain. And then in a domain where no market can deliver any good except the government because no market will ever provide roads, railway lines, even airports, I wonder, and certainly flight zones have to be also bargained with all the people living below. So we need a government for this. And so where we ultimately need the government, the government is just using a market principle. And only if it lives up to the market principle, it's delivering the good. Now, isn't that weird to do as a government? Wouldn't it be more logical to think, I'm a government for the entire population? Shouldn't I serve everybody well? Shouldn't it be about not whether you can pay, but whether you need it? That would be, for me, a very logical way to look at it. But we've gone so ingrained in this economic perspective that 
cost benefit and response is an obvious way to go. So that's, that's some, from like a public goods perspective. And then there's a philosophical perspective. Cost benefit analysis is a practical tool that came from the utilitarian perspective on justice. Now that was developed late 18th century, John Stuart Mill, amongst others, and Bentham. And it was a radically progressive philosophy when it was introduced. What is it says? The greatest good for the greatest number. And that principle applied in the late 18th century basically would mean that if you give something to the poor, that would be very beneficial because there were so many poor. There was a very tiny group of people doing well. So any investment of the government going to that tiny group doing very, very well wouldn't generate much benefits. I mean, thousand people times one dollar is only thousand dollar. Now, if I have something that generates only 10 cents for millions of people, it generates more benefit. And so utilitarianism was in a way a progressive philosophy saying, you know, we should look at everybody and looking at everybody meant also looking at the majority poor people and we should act what serves the majority well. Now this works very well in society of mostly poor people because it will work to the benefits of the poor. But basically what the rule does is it works to the benefit of the majority. So in that time, this were the poor, and so it was radically progressive theory. But if you still apply it till today, then the majority is middle income and higher income. And so anything that you do for middle and higher income will always work out better than what you'll do for the 10, 15 percent. And fourthly, we have a relatively small group of people who are poor will never deliver so many benefits as what you do for the well-off. And certainly not if you value their, their time differently, if you take into account that they made longer trips so they can save more time on each trip, if you take into account that they make more trips because they have more places to go to and spend their money on. So there are all kind of detailed effects too, but the fundamental idea is that utilitarianism is not really a theory of justice. It doesn't really care about the people. It doesn't take everybody seriously. So if the people are already rich gain more than those who are very poor lose, it is considered just in utilitarianism. Now, intuitively, I think most people would agree that doesn't make much sense in most cases. And so, cost benefit analysis fails on two. It's, it's based on a philosophy that is highly problematic. And it's basically telling the government to behave as if it's a market player where it's providing a public good, which is bizarre. And now there's a third problem with cost-benefit analysis that it tends to, it doesn't relate to the goal you want to achieve. So if your goal is to achieve sufficient accessibility and you, you use cost-benefit analysis, what may come out is an investment that hardly improves the situation of people who have very low accessibility comes out much better because we count all kind of benefits, uh, maybe climate change, local air pollution, noise. And so I had a goal and it just is evaporates while I'm applying my cost benefit analysis because the total, the grand total is more important than my goal. And if the alternatives do not promote a fair transport system, they should not be considered at all. And so once you do this selection first, then you can maybe do cost benefit analysis because then your goal is set and everything you choose will achieve that goal and maybe some project will do it more efficiently, more benefits against lower cost. That's fine with me. We should be efficient. We should spend our money very carefully, but we should spend it very carefully on the goal we want to achieve. Transfer projects are not generating money. They're providing access. That's what you should measure. In a developed country, they do not strengthen the economy. If you want to strengthen the economy, there are thousands of ways in which you can do it much better than by wasting billions on improving your transport system. That's not how it works. Awesome. Well, so the book is Transport Justice. Where can folks find it? Any library. You can find it, of course, at the website of the, of the publisher, but also you can order it in uh, local bookshops. I know that you like to promote them. I also strongly promote them. It's a wonderful scheme that you order online, but the local shop still benefits from that. Yeah, yeah. Bookshop.org here in the U.S. If you want to yeah. get the book, go to bookshop.org in your local bookshop, which you would have picked up the book or ordered the book from. This way, my bookstore is called Folio Books. I used to walk over there and say, hey, can I get this book? And I showed them a picture on my phone or whatever, and mm -hmm. they would order it for me. And then it goes through them, which is, you know, supports my local business. But it's not like going to larger chains that, you know, aren't supporting a local economy. So yeah, bookshop.org for now. And then when you get out of pandemic, go to your bookshop <laughs> and order it. <laughs> meet people. Exactly. exactly. And meet people. Yeah. Well, Carol, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate my it. Pleasure. Thanks a lot for having me.
And thanks for joining us. The Talking Kid Ways podcast is a project of the Overhead Wire and posted first at Streets Blog USA. Thanks to our wonderful Patreon supporters for sponsoring this show and Mondays at the Overhead Wire. You can support the show by going to patreon.com slash the Overhead Wire. You can sign up for our 15-year-old newsletter at theoverheadwire.com. And you can listen to the show on your podcatcher of choice, including Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, and Apple Podcasts. And if you can't find it there, you can always find it at its original home at usa.streetsblog.org. We'll see you next time at Talking Headways. <laughs>